What is up, YouTube? Welcome to Advent of Code 2021, or at least as far as I get. The plan with these series of videos is quite simple. I'm doing Advent of Code. I will probably stream some of it now that I'm back in town. And I thought it would be kind of fun to just talk through what I did for some of the examples, for problems. I've been doing it in Rust this year, so I mean, obviously, the main reason that I want to make these videos is to say that I'm using Rust, but that probably goes without saying. I think you already all know that. So anyways, the what we're going to do is we're just going to walk through my solutions. My solutions won't always be the perfect one. We I'm happy to chat more about it in the comments below, of course. And we'll just sort of learn some new things about Rust, learn some new things about computer science stuff, learn new ways of chatting and talking, and all that kind of good stuff. So that's it. With that, let's go ahead and get started. So basically, day one, where we'll start, is quite simple. In the beginning, you have these numbers, and they're just like, hey, we want to know when you're decreasing depth. Okay, cool. How do we decrease the depth? Well, you just check if the next number is bigger. Of course, depth is the opposite of what you'd normally think. So this is classic, doesn't really matter. And so what you need to do is you just need to count these up. So there's seven in this example. This is actually super easy to solve in Rust um, because you can turn things into iterators. But before we do that, I'll show you how I got this nifty little function right here. So I made myself my own little library that I use inside of this Rust project. The Rust project is structured as follows. In source, I have a bunch of the different days and I have a lib.rs, okay? Each of the different days are a different binary. So what I can do is I can say cargo run bin day one. It'll run that day. So this is quite nice because I can keep everything in the same project and I can have sort of the same idea, but I can have different uh, run times e for each of these easily. This is not super complicated. You just make a new bin entry every time you want to do one and you point it to a file. I happen to name all mines day seven and day seven.rs. You can call them whatever you like. The difference is here, I also have one lib. As far as I can tell, you're only allowed to have one lib per crate, but you could make multiple crates within one workspace, but that is a topic for a different day. And I don't know it well enough yet to explain it to you off the top of my head anyways. So that's kind of how this project is structured. So I made one lib file and we'll be adding to this as time goes on. But the first thing is in advent of code, as you know, if you've done these in general, what you do is you're going to be looking at files like this one dot example, and it's just going to be like a list of these numbers. It's like, okay, I don't want to write exactly the same thing every single time over and over. So instead we can write it actually like this. And what happens here is I say, I'm going to read one per line. And then if you're not super familiar with Rust, which it's not an expectation that you need to be for this series, because I'm going to try and explain some of the stuff. This is a generic function. So this T just means some particular type. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some path to a file and we're going to return a vector of things of this type. So we read the file as a string. We split it on new lines. We filter map, which is this combination of mapping plus filtering. So effectively what happens is uh, you do map, which is you take whatever your input was to the function, and now you're going to change it to some other one, and you still are iterating through. But filter map only takes ones that are okay. So we have options and results in Rust. We'll talk a little bit more about those maybe on a different video. But basically, if you return okay, then this will be added to whatever is getting mapped here. And so then we can collect them. This collect will actually collect this into a vector because it knows that I'm asking for a vector up here. The T part is cool because we can actually just pass this in and Rust will figure out what type it should be where possible. Other times we'll just have to tell it. So for example, in day one, I actually say, okay, I actually want all these numbers to be U32s. So now when it reads one per line, it says, okay, the T that we have here is this T. So I'm going to return a vector of those. So that's all that's going on there. So basically parse these into U32s, give me a list of them. And this problem becomes very simple if you know that the Rust standard library has this very, very nice little function called Windows. What does Windows do? It effectively takes a list and it turns it into chunks of per 
overlapping chunks of particular size, right? So if you had something like one, two, three, four, this would make something like one, two, two, three, and then three, four. So you'd get all those different chunks uh, as an iterator over. So that makes it very easy to ask the question, hey, is the one that we started with less than the next one? And I'll explain why I wrote it this way after we do part two. But that's all this problem is. So we collect all the ones that match this filter, and then we just ask for what's the length of this vector. So this is quite cool. I think it's a nice and pretty solution. Uh, as much as you can in Rust, I think you want to put everything on one line because it really shows that you're a master of the language and you're just an excellent programmer. But in this case, I think it actually works out quite well. You can see exactly what we're going to do. We're going to read the line into a list of U32s. We're going to get the windows of each size, which for part one is just two. We're going to say, hey, is the first element less than the last element? If so, keep it in our list. We're going to collect those into a vector. And then we're going to ask for the length of that because we're just adding one every time we do that. That's the result. And for this case, we get 14A2, which does happen to be my answer. Uh, you get this after you solve them. It'll tell you the right answer after you're done, uh, <laughs> not before. For part two, for part two, this is a kind of fun solution uh, that, that we came up with here because effectively what we have, if you think about it, is you have this sliding window and let's say you've got um, one, two, I'm just gonna use numbers here that are easy to do for this. For number two, we chose descending window. And I think this is a cool solution because what we, you, the naive solution, the first solution that you can just do is you could basically sum up the first three numbers and compare with the next three numbers, okay? And that's good, that's a good solution there. That's a pretty good solution. And it's not really that much more expensive. So you can just compare the sums of the two. But if all you're interested in is whether one sum is less or greater than the previous sum, you really just need to compare if the different values in both sets are different. And let me show you what I mean. So let's say we've got one, two, three, four here, and then we've got two, three, four, five here. You'll notice if you think about this, these middle two, these middle values here, two and two, three and three, four and four, they're the same. So if we want to compare them, we can do ye old algebra trick. You guys know what I'm talking about, like y x equals y equals five. Well, you know that you can just say y equals five minus x, just subtract x from both sides. A classic algebra move. So if you do that, you'll notice that these basically don't matter at all. And so you can just check if the first guy is less than the last guy, and it's all equivalent. So we can actually just say that it's descending window four. Uh, and so that's why we've got this size minus one, which is a little bit confusing for this first case, but I think it's super cool whenever I can solving part one and part two with basically the same code. So anyways, that's basically everything we've got for day one. I'll try and record some more of these. I've got a bunch of the things solved, not as many as the primogen currently because I fell behind. It's a sad state of affairs, but what are you going to do? He has more children and he's cooler than I am. But I'll do my best still, okay? I will still do my best, so we'll catch up to him. Anyways, that's it for day one. I hope to see you all in day two. If you like this, if you want to see something different, a different style, different information, whatever, let me know in the comments below, and I will see you all for day two. Bye, everybody.